Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Google Plus itself. And Google Plus. But, yes. Yeah. The one thing they haven't done is the chat window and using it to its fullest. But anyway, hey, we're live. And again, Dandles of Dorkington, Jeff Blythe, this is us talking to you. And if you can see by the little square, there's another bald man joining us today that's not me. And uh, that's Stephen Toulouse, Steptoe, hey. as some of you might have known him through his various random exploits in the interweb. Steptoe, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. How are you guys doing? Good. Doing awesome. Uh, good, good week for me. Uh, good, good day. So I'm, awesome. I'm all right. Yeah, those are always good to have. Yeah, uh, you, they are. <laughs> you've been doing some traveling. Did you make it down near uh, New Orleans for your birthday? I know that that was a plan. I did, and it's a funny story behind that. See, my birthday is actually in August. Correct. Uh, in fact, uh, my 40th birthday was the day that the Mars rover landed on Mars, so when Curiosity landed. So we had a combination birthday party and Mars rover watching party. We uh, went to a Seattle sports bar and actually bought out some space at the sports bar and had them retune all of the big 40-inch HD TVs to NASA TV. <laughs> well, I'm it glad that, uh, I couldn't awesome. be there, but I'm really glad that you got my present, which was the rover. Uh, it was it was, <laughs> really, it was really hard to orchestrate. Thank you. I had very to spend, of you. I had to spend a little bit, but you know, you you're keeping it real with the baldness, so you know I have to tell it. I'm telling you, yeah. So uh, so the Halloween thing comes from an interesting story. When I was when I turned 30, I told Rochelle that all I wanted was a party with all my friends, and, and that's it. And she wanted to give me, like, a surprise party, but she knew that I would figure it out. Mm -hmm. So my 30th birthday came and went, and I didn't get a party. We had a nice dinner. I got nice presents and everything, but I didn't get the party that I wanted, so I was kind of, <laughs> was kind of upset. Aww. And so flash forward to Halloween, and Rochelle says, okay, we're going to... At this point, we lived in we lived in Dallas, and uh -huh. uh, my brothers, my I have a middle brother and a younger brother, uh, they also lived in Dallas. And she's like, your brothers are throwing a costume party. We're going to the costume party. I'm like, I don't want to go to the costume party. <laughs> but she convinced me to go. And so we ended up going to the, my brother's house, and as we pull up into the driveway, there's this white van uh, in the driveway. And I'm like, oh, that must be you know, someone who – other people – who right. are attending the party because she said there were going to be a lot of people there. And as I get out of the car, uh, there's a, a flash bulb goes off inside the car, what looks like a flash bulb. And, and I was kind of like, did you see that? And she goes, I didn't see anything. What are you talking about? You're crazy. Let's just move on. And as we <laughs> walk by the van, all the doors open, and it's all my friends. <laughs> And it was a, it was a, her way of surprising me by waiting until Halloween. Now here's the really funny part. She said it was a costume party. We were the only ones in costume. <laughs> so nobody else was in costume. And so so from that point on, we said every on our decade birthdays, we'll we'll have a celebration on Halloween. That's adorable. So. This past Halloween, uh, I went down to New Orleans to celebrate with my family. Rochelle, unfortunately, at the last minute, couldn't make it because Aww. she has now joined a private practice and is seeing clients, uh, psychology counseling. Okay. And so that was a, that's a huge thing because now yeah. she's going to use her degree. Right. And it was it was like, well, you're following your dream. I guess I guess <laughs> I can forgive you not going to New Orleans. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really nice fair. of you. Yeah, that's, that's big of you. That, that's, I congratulate so, your your benevolence, sir. <laughs> so if any if anybody ever gets a chance, if you're listening, uh, you know New, New Orleans is uh, an amazing place, and it is a, a a fantastic place to have a good time. The best time I I tell people to go to New Orleans is Halloween because you get all of the fun and the craziness of Mardi Gras. Right. People are dressed up in costumes, Bourbon Street and the quarter is full of people, but it's not 1.3 million people like right. it is at Mardi Gras. It's a lot less. So you go two blocks down from Bourbon and it's, it's a fairly empty street, so you don't have the quarter filled with all of these people. And it's a it's a great way to have a blast, but not be in that situation where there's so many intoxicated individuals. Oh in yeah, one place. 
I, I think I went, uh, I went when I was a kid, I think it was 14, 15, the week after Mardi Gras, whenever people were still in the, you know, in the gutters. Yeah. <laughs> and well, picking no, they, themselves they, up. So have you ever been to Mardi Gras? I have never been. So the quarter is, is if you think of it as a square, and it, it really is. I mean, it's, it's a very old part of the city. And uh, it's, it's by the river adjacent to downtown. Mm-hmm. It's not very big. It's only uh, 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 something like a couple dozen blocks by a couple dozen blocks. And it's, it's again, laid out in a grid pattern. Now, in Mardi Gras, right. the rule is that the mayor of the city surrenders control of the city to the king of Mardi Gras for 24 hours. That's actually on the day of Tuesday. So midnight Monday to midnight Tuesday, the, the, the mob rules the city. Right. And, uh, and then, but... but Here's the thing. At 11.59 p.m. on Tuesday is when the cops line up on one end of the quarter. And it's a line of policemen with, like, riot shields. Uh And right behind that is a line of policemen on horseback. And right after that is a line of these police cars and, um, and vans. And then the line behind that is a bunch of trucks that have uh, uh, high pressure hoses. And then the line behind that are the street sweepers, and the line behind that are the garbage trucks. <laughs> and they all line up, right? And as soon as that clock ticks toward midnight, they begin marching down the quarter. Now, as they begin marching down the quarter, the, you know, the smart people who've been to Mardi Gras a million times, they're up in balconies above the street. That's right. about, let's, let's call that 20% of the population. Oops, sorry, I'm getting a phone call. You're fine. How very dare you! I want to hear the rest. I meant to turn the I meant to turn the phone off. All right. Oh, are you still there? Yes. Yeah. Sir. Okay. So um okay so as they're marching down, there's 20 percent of people who are in the balconies. There's another uh let's call it 60 percent who are smart and know that they're supposed to be off the street, so they they immediately move off the street into the bars. So okay. the bars don't have to close. You just have to be off the street. Gotcha. Then there's the 20% that are standing in the middle of the street facing an army of policemen oh, and high pressure no. hoses going, come on, man, you know, you know just <laughs> give me a little bit more, man. Just one more, one more to drink, man. You can't make me go to bed. Not <laughs> now. And... The funny part about those guys is like it took it takes two seconds, man. They get like one club to the knee, they go down, they get their hands tied behind their back, and they're whoop, they're in the they're in the wagon. And then once those guys are cleared off, they high pressure hose down the street and street sweep it. And the next day, it's almost like they're you had no idea there was a party. That's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, if you don't believe me, go on YouTube and look up like Mardi Gras cleanup video or stuff like that, <laughs> and you'll see some of what I'm talking about. It's crazy. That's uh, awesome. And you know, like people don't believe me, and I'm like, I, I don't like to go to Mardi Gras anymore. Yeah. It's just too crowded. But if you get the chance, and especially if you're on a balcony, yeah, it's a hell of a show at the end of the night on Tuesday. <laughs> Yeah, let's just go for that. Let, let's just go and we watch. won't even get in until 6 o'clock and we'll just sit on a roof and watch <laughs> and laugh. Uh, a friend of mine got us a balcony overlooking um, uh, Bourbon um, and uh, uh, I think it was St. Peter and for Halloween. And that by itself was just a ton of fun. Uh, oh, it was so much fun just watching the people below us. Now my brother and his girlfriend went as... Frozen corpses from the Titanic. And their costumes were brilliant. Their costumes were in fact, in fact, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna tweet I'm gonna tweet the costume. I'm gonna tweet them in costume. And anybody watching can go to uh, twitter.com forward slash steptoe and see my brother's and his girlfriend's amazing Titanic costume. I'm gonna tweet this right now. There you go. So, did you dress up at all? So, I I I did in a way. What I did was I had um, what's known as an audio costume mm-hmm. from Think Geek. 
let me tweet this for the G plus crowd. Uh, <laughs> my brother and his girlfriend's Halloween costume. Okay, because this is just too brilliant not to share because they did an amazing job. All right. Uh, so what I had was ThinkGeek has what's known as an audio costume. Okay. And it's a gyroscope that you hook to your front of your belt and an associated speaker system that you hook somewhere else on you. And the gyroscope can tell when you're moving and doing things. Mm -hmm. And then it has a set of sounds that go with it. So, like, if you were a, uh, like, there's several different preloaded ones, like Robot, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 80s video game heroes. So it goes, you know, when you jump up, it goes, ding! Um, nice. And so, and Zombie. And so you can just shuffle along and it'll automatically do the hurr. You don't have to do anything. It's brilliant. <laughs> it is so brilliant. And it was such a huge hit because I did the heavy industrial robot. And the sound effects were like, um, you know, the power loader in, in, in Aliens? Yeah. That's what the sound effects were like. So it was like, so I would like walk down the street and it'd go, chung, 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 chung. and people were just like, like, I ran out of batteries. People were making me do tricks and stuff with it. It was so much fun. Uh, so I didn't dress in like a full on costume because I was traveling, but uh, it, it turned out to be a lot of fun. Yeah, but that got you just as much, if not more, attention. So it did, but they beat me out. I mean, if you if yeah. you have a chance, look at that Twitter picture. I will. I'll I'll, I'll check it out. I she like that. Fashion the icicles out of the icicles are like hot glue, and uh, and then they have these. Uh, they had snow dust on their cheeks, and then they had makeup to make them look pale. Um, it was brilliant, and they couldn't walk five feet without oh people gosh. stopping them for a picture. This you, is did you amazing. Pull it up? Oh, holy shit. Is that not great? That's awesome. And they carried around that Titanic life life buoy thing, and people stopped them everywhere. I mean, and even the picture kind of doesn't do it justice. I mean, in person, it was even better. Yeah, I can, I can see the beginnings of the icicles, like on the hat and on the buoy, but oh, man, that's awesome. Yeah, they did a great job. It, it makes me feel so inept with my costume, which was Slapdash. It makes me feel Bush League. Well, I kind of cheated, right? I just paid ThinkGeek to give me a soundtrack. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. No, well, I, that's not my part. I, I paid the Halloween store for a Bane mask and just used my own baldness to my advantage. There you go. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. It's the only uh, it's the only comic book s character that I can get without having to shave the goatee that would take me months to grow back. So, oh, yeah. I was thinking. Yeah, I think you're right. There, yeah, it's there really are sad. no there are no bearded <laughs> comic Very book cute. characters. It's completely uh, all the great ones. Now there's tons of bald villains, yeah. but yeah. none of them have any facial hair. You're right. Yeah, yeah. It make it, it hurts. And I can't grow the rest of this like a normal guy. It just doesn't. No. Months and months of work. <laughs> so, um, I've seen you just started playing some Halo 4. Yes. How you liking it? Uh, so, before I left Microsoft, I mean, I knew a lot of what they were doing. And I think there was a lot of pressure a ton. on 343 to get it right. And, and I felt really terrible for those guys because... They, they knew the pressure was there, but they had a direction they wanted to go. And I think it's fantastic and amazing that they didn't waver right. uh, even a little bit. They were like, we kind of want a different look. We kind of want a different sound. We kind of want a different feel. Not just in the, in the gameplay mechanics, but I think they walked a little bit further down the path that I was hoping Halo would start to go and tell, make that single-player story much more emotional. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my personal favorite Halo is actually ODST. Me too. Uh, because it tells, yeah, I mean, it tells a lot of, of very human stories in a very crisp way. And so I'm, I'm, I'm amazed, astounded, but not really necessarily surprised that they nailed it. 
right. so I mean I think so far ODST is my favorite but I mean I'm part of the way through Halo 4 and I'm a huge Halo single player dude I mean yeah. I've, I've yeah. read all the books I've got the encyclopedia I've seen all the anime I've read the comics I'm invested in this world I'm invested in this story the right. multiplayer I'm so terrible at <laughs> I'm not good I'm the grab hammer guy there you go. Right. Hey, everybody, everybody has I'm gonna one sit, thing. I'm going to sit in the corner, and I may only get two kills a map, but by God, you felt them. Yes. <laughs> the controller shook. That's how, that's how much you felt them. But the single player, I'm, I'm really, really proud of the team um, because they stayed true to their vision. They executed in a way that is reju sort of a... Um, uh, uh, revitalizing in a way the, the the franchise because we're we're now off on a new trilogy, right? It's the Reclaimer trilogy. Um, this is feeding into a lot of the Forerunner mythos as we talk about how we look at the Prometheans. I don't want to do any spoilers, right. but thank you. This is a this is an epic story. This is a story that I am so happy to finally get to visit from the opening moments of Halo Four, uh, the interrogation which is a cut scene just in the opening, so I won't go any further than that. Right. When I saw that, I was like, I, I know what's going on here. I now know I who to, is talking to who. <laughs> I have to ask, my favorite thing about ODST was that I felt vulnerable. And I haven't played any other campaign. I've just been playing multiplayer. Um, I know Chief's a badass to the badassiest of badassery. Do you still feel that vulnerability, at least from a psychological level? I think you feel it in a in a way that is not the same as ODST. ODST made you feel that way because you weren't a Spartan. Exactly. What what they do with Halo Four, and again, I, I'm very cognizant of not spoiling plot here. They make you feel exceedingly vulnerable, as if you think Master Chief has been asked to do the impossible under a tight timeline before. Mm -hmm. The stakes are even higher now. Okay. Uh, the 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 things that he has to do have an emotional impact to another principal character in the game. Okay. And so it makes those moments feel like, yeah, you're kind of a badass, but you're, you're thrown into such an impossible situation. What I loved about the game was I started off on normal difficulty, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to say I... I I mean, I didn't really super struggle through the f the first few moments on Forward Under Dawn, but mm -hmm. there were plenty of times where I had to take cover and get my shields recharged in the opening part of the game, which is kind of rare. That's good. No, no I'm, I'm all for that. Yeah, usually they ease you into it. Yeah. Uh, this time they kind of throw you into it. And um, so well, by this point, you should be ready for it. That's true. I mean, this is, this is like you said, the beginning of a second trilogy. There have been five games before it. Most of the... I mean, I'd say the core audience is they're all returning. You know, they're, they're coming back. So yeah, In a big it, way. Yeah, it, I'm glad that they don't kind of hand it to you and spoon feed you. But, hey, you know how to do this. Now let's see what you can do. Yeah, I think um, knowing what I know about the mythos, knowing what I know about the world that surrounds what's currently going on, uh, I would say to people, if, if you're just starting out on Halo 4, you haven't picked it up yet, and you're going to, Absolutely, watch the Forward Unto Dawn miniseries. Yeah. I was going to segue, but you already took me to it. How, how I mean, did you feel about it? What, so it, it's a it's it's kind of funny. I it, the first episode I felt was a little bit derivative of Battlestar Galactica, <laughs> okay. and I don't mean plot. I mean the way it feels and the way it looks and the way it's oh, shot. Yeah, I can and see that realize, very much. Though. Uh, many of the sequences in Forward Unto Dawn were shot in the same location in Vancouver as many of the sequences in Battlestar Galactica. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think that contributed a little bit, but once I got to the end, um, it sold me. I mean, once I got to the end, I'm like, this character has a part to play in the game, and I'm now really looking forward to seeing how that plays out. And I think that, that choosing that live-action method of telling that story is exciting and fun. And I, I mean, Halo, a lot of people say, how would you make a movie out of Halo? The main character barely ever talks. He, he never sees his face. It's really about the mythos. Yeah, it's about the universe that they've created. 
It really is. I mean, you have you have heavyweight science fiction authors like Greg Bear, yeah. who are writing now in the Halo universe, and writing amazing stories too. And when you have that rich a uh, mythos, I think there's plenty of space for a movie. I agree. I've often said I wanted a uh, a Fall of Reach movie, if nothing else. I would have loved a Fall of Reach movie because I think it's it's easy to convey. There's plenty of just from what we've seen in the uh, the scanned trailer. There's so much there that's iconic images that would translate well to an audience of people that don't even know about those games. And it's a classic tragedy, right? You yeah. know the end, right? Yeah. You know the end. I mean, I remember when they released the the Halo Reach teaser. Do you remember that? Yep. It was just the image of the planet on fire, Burning. and it was all yeah. this static saying, "We need help. We need help. We need help. We need this. It's t- we're being attacked." And then there's that crisp, like you know, cut, and that voice that stands out and says, "You know, you have Spartans on the ground." Yeah. And there's that chill, because you know they're they're doomed in a way, but you also know that that certain things happen in that plot line that are positive for the future. Mm-hmm. And that's just a classic way to create that dramatic tension. Yeah, it comes across great. I would love to see that. Yeah. Uh, I think if you were to take it from the, the the Nylon book and then run it through Reach, I think that, that that right there would be enough to satiate fans as well as new fans you bring in from a movie or whatever medium you wanted to show it live action. Let me ask otherwise. you guys, let me, let me ask you a question. How do you feel about the Terminals? I like them uh, because it gives me some more information without it, without pushing it. It's it's not there for everybody. You have to find it. You have to want it. See, that's kind of my problem, though. Yeah, I don't. I don't use them at all. It's like. But is that because? So here's my here's when I'm playing. I get into, in some form or fashion, mm-hmm. the idea that I'm I'm there. So when a game gives me something that breaks that mold, like if, I, let's be honest, if I'm an ODST and I'm trying to solve a mystery and I'm looking all around, and, but, I, but this one thing is off to the side and starts to give me this backstory, sometimes that feels like I'm being pulled out. Like if I was an ODST and I touched a terminal and it had nothing to do with the plot, I'd yeah. stop the terminal and move on with my investigation in, in, in a real scenario. Here's, no, here's, right. my, yeah. here's my thing with the terminals. Um, I have a really hard time, personally, just uh, keeping track of the storyline. Not because it's done badly, um, but just my brain... I was discussing this the other day. It, I have a really hard time separating... Well, actually combining the um, cutscenes and then the actual play... Right. Um, when I go back and forth, I have a really difficult time combining them. Uh, it gets worse with terminals too. Exactly. To, to and your that's point, like, because now you're adding, you're usually adding another plot. Yes. It's not necessarily yeah. it, it feeds into what you're doing, but it's actually separate. Right. And so I just don't like. I don't need anything more to confuse myself. And I know that about myself, so yeah. I just I just don't touch it. And if I want more information, well, I'm going to go read a book or I'm going to go watch some of the supplemental right. stuff. So here's my argument for terminals. Okay. And it's due to the rest of the first person sh- genre on a whole, because oftentimes there are just randomized collectibles that you have to wander around to find, if for nothing else than the achievement point. <laughs> right, right, right. At least, and this is what how I've always felt about them. At least I'm getting something. Yeah, I see both points. I see my my. I think I would like to see terminals almost like. I guess my problem is not the plot that they reveal. Mm-hmm. I guess my problem is a little bit along the lines of there are these hidden nuggets that some, like, on one level, one is obvious. And so, yeah, that's and true. And you didn't go look for them because you're playing the game. Right. So the dyna- I, I love what terminals do in enhancing the richness of the story. I'm not sure I like what they do when I realize near the end of the map Oh, I didn't get a terminal. I, I should probably go back. Yeah. And now I'm broken. Now I'm out of the narrative. Yeah. Trying to go find some more narrative. And again, it's it's kind of a it works for some people, doesn't work for others. Yeah. I love the story they tell. I wish terminals 
maybe you weren't. And that's my sole criticism. I mean, that's yeah. it. I mean, Which the rest is of the game. I mean, impressive. Everything else is phenomenal. So let's find this compromise of uh, no terminals. Let's put all that information on smart glass. And then if you want it, it's there. <laughs> hey, and if you, you don't know what? want it, that's, there a, you go. that's an interesting idea because, I mean, it's, it's, you're free to ignore it. Exactly. Yeah. My, my problem with terminals is when you find one that's obvious. Yeah, and so you walk up to it, I know. and you press X, and yep. you watch this story, and you're like, that was really cool. And then four levels later, you find another one that's obvious, and yeah. you you're three, you're missed three chunks of it, so it's, yeah. it's disjointed. Yeah. I like the idea of smart glass being the value add there that you can say, well, if I want to, if I have a smart glass capable device, then there's some things that I can do to enhance the story. But if not, it's not detracting. Exactly. Yeah. Just give me that information during a loading screen. <laughs> I just you know, I, put, I, I put the controller to the side, pick up my tablet, and I'm reading Mythos. I'm a it. huge fan. I don't know if you guys have played the director's commentary editions of Portal or Half-Life 2, Episode 2. I uh, played into them, but never through the entire narrative. I will always give it a broken. try because they're fun. They're brilliant because what they do is you play the game, but over certain parts are like question, uh, these symbols. I don't remember if they're question marks or not. And you walk up to it and you activate it, and you actually hear the creators of the game yeah. what? come over the speakers yeah. and say, well, in this particular place, we thought we felt this, that, or the other. And we had a hard time trying to figure this out. It's that, awesome. I didn't even know that was a thing. It's a thing. It's a thing. And Valve really pioneered it, um, to my knowledge. I'm sure someone will email me and tell me that someone else did it before. <laughs> of course. But... But Valve, I think, pioneered it in the orange box, uh, but it's also available on all their Steam copies. And it's, it is so fascinating. It is mm -hmm. so ridiculously fascinating. Because I dug you, it. Huh? I said I dug it. I, I really enjoyed oh, yeah. it. And I, I, played. I wish more games did that. I wish more games uh, had a mode where you could experience that because there's times in a game where you reach a point and you go, well, that's just stupid. Yeah. Why'd they do that, you know? And the developer can say, well, we, we thought the other way was the right way to go, but we found in playtesting that too many people were doing X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Interesting. And yeah. a lot of people, like, they just throw the controller at the screen instead of, <laughs> instead of wondering maybe there's an explanation. <laughs> right. And I, I do like it. I like uh, that the developers are getting more transparent as we move forward. I love the vid docs that they released for Halo 4. I thought that right. they were... I mean, they've done it with previous titles as well, but it was so much more of a a showcase of the talent making it instead of the pure focus on the game. Yeah. They, they really wanted you to know the people because you are having to trust a completely new set of hands with your baby, essentially. Yeah. And I thought that they did a great job this time around, and I would like to see more developers move forward in giving, uh, you know, some humanity to the people that are coding or that are the community people behind it. Well, if... For those for those who are watching, I did a wonderful Q and A with Chet and Eric of Valve Software, who are the writers of Left for Dead and mm -hmm. Portal, uh, and their associated sequels. Uh, they're not the sole ones, of course, but but they are they're uh, uh, excellent voices to hear about how to write video games. And one of the things we talked about was this philosophy of when do you tell the story. I, I, I tried to reach some. I tried to reach a point where I was asking them this question: When you're a writer of a video game, and especially a first-person game, mm -hmm. the player is sometimes your enemy in terms of narrative, yeah. because you can't control them. They're the one factor you can't control. Right. So they're ripping the narrative out of your hands so that they can go wander around looking for achievements or terminals or something. And how do you how do you balance that? And what I liked about their answer, and, and you can, this was at uh, uh, this was at PAX Prime. Yes. And it's a, a recorded session that you can pick up on. I think Twitch TV is where they ended up recording it. Uh, so you can see the whole session with with us. And they they brought up the fact that at Valve, they really feel like the narrative is the most important thing, but the player is a partner. It didn't seem like they felt like the player was a competitor. Here's one of the greatest right. examples: is like they don't do. Or to the extent that they do, they feel bad when they do it. Any type of unskippable narrative. That's true. If you think about it, it makes sense. Like if you think about Half Life and you think about Portal and Left for Dead, all the moments of narrative that are rich and deep, you can walk away from. 
Yeah. You as the player still have control. It's not some locked in cutscene. Yeah. That's well, true. How many people right? got all the way through Portal and had no idea what it was other than puzzles? Yeah. Yeah, you could just walk away from whatever GLaDOS is saying or you can just or walk away from whatever Eli is saying in in Half-Life 2 or yeah. or, you know, any of those things. And I always felt that that was that was such a level of trust in the player on the part of the creator that it yeah. made me feel better about playing their games because there's there's things I there's I hate unskippable cutscenes and I hate accidentally skipped cutscenes, mm-hmm. like where you're just sitting there and you bump a button and you oh. skip the whole thing. Yeah, I, I I wish more games took the Valve approach and said, "We're in engine. Uh, you can walk away." Yeah. yeah, you know, or you can stay, but but whatever you do doesn't necessarily affect the narrative that's being played out. We're giving you the choice. I think I think that's. Good game design. I agree. Yeah, I, I would I would have to agree with you one hundred percent there. It was good. I I think that while playing them I I appreciated it, but now I want to go all the way through. Whereas I just I would dip my toes in because it was a novelty that I really dug. I think kind of the same way I feel about directors' cuts in movies a lot of the times. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean you you kinda have that moment where sometimes the director's cut's not better. Right, right. Um, <laughs> or you or just don't have it. time, and you play through yeah. it once, and you look at that as, ah, oh, crap, now i got to play through it again. Right, right. <laughs> I'll get to it. I'll get to it eventually, after all the other games. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't want to keep you for too long, but I did, uh, I, I did want to ask you a few questions uh, as sure. far as, I mean, 20 years, nearly. 20 years at Microsoft. Yeah. I mean... I used to have hair. You did, yeah. I've seen pictures. Microsoft stole it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you, and whether people know it or not, I mean, you were, for all intents and purposes, King Van Hammer. I was. For Xbox yeah. Live, I was, yes. Um, give me a story that's the most, uh, the, the one story that stands out more than anything else. It could be good or bad. Wow. But I just, I, I would love to know. <laughs> I'd love to pick your brain on that. Um, I have a story that I tell uh, in some of my PAX talks that's probably probably one of my favorites because it exemplifies where I think online behavior needs to move to. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's always a place for... Um, I, I like to divide content on the internet from from interactivity on the internet sometimes. Yeah. Meaning that there's tons of places on the internet to have fun, crass humor. There's tons, tons of places on the internet to have serious drama. Interactivity is a little bit different because now you're talking about you're impacting other people's experiences and how they're enjoying their time online. And when we think about time online, when we think about what we do when we connect to the internet, actually connect to the internet is a stupid phrase because we're always connected now, right? Yeah. That's true. Um, it, it comes down to how people treat each other. I agree. And one of the things I talked about in a, in a recent speech at PAX Prime was about online behavior and the lack of consequence for particularly egregious yeah. uh, behavior. And this could be misogynistic behavior. This has become a topic that I am very happy to see has gotten a lot more prevalence homophobic behavior, racial behavior, yeah. bullying. All of these things combined together are are sort of considered at some level to be, well, that's the Internet. And I think we're moving away from that, and that's good. So the story that I have to tell is along the lines of a mantra that I stole from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, <laughs> which is that we need to move beyond... Will's law. We need to move beyond Wheaton's law that says don't be a dick. Yeah. I think don't be a dick is a good starting place. Sure. I think we need to move further than that. I think we need to be excellent to each other. And the story that I tell about that is around the game called Bulletstorm. Did you guys ever play Bulletstorm? All the way through. I didn't. But... Did you ever play multiplayer? <laughs> Twice. Because <laughs> the people that I knew did not want to play multiplayer. <laughs> So, so you know that in Bulletstorm single player, the, uh-huh. the more spectacular and unique 
the kill, the more points you get. Right. Right? Which translated over into multiplayer as well. Right, right, right. So in multiplayer, you had waves of enemies coming at you. It wasn't about killing them. You could kill them, that's fine. But you had to earn enough points to pass to the next level. And the way that you earned points was by doing unique and spectacular kills. Right. My team did not know this. Oh. So we were playing the game. There were about, I think, seven of us. And then, uh, and we were mediocre at best. And there was one guy who was just incredible. And he was doing spectacular kills left and right. He was doing amazing stuff. He was, essentially, he was carrying the team. But we didn't know how. Like, we just kept passing levels. Right. When we finally got up to that point where he couldn't carry us anymore, the level cap required us all to be doing at least better than we were, Mm -hmm. and he couldn't make up the gap. Now, that guy, right, we've probably at some point been that guy where you're in a game and everybody's just not as good as you, and they're just below your skill level. I'm not saying you're great, but they're below your skill level. And you think to yourself, oh, I'm just going to quit and go rematch against people who are my skill level. He could have done that. Yeah. Instead, he stopped and he said, guys, listen, I want you to all step back on this next wave. And I just want you to watch, okay? And we were like, oh, but, but if you say so. I, you know, <laughs> none of us were like, we couldn't figure out why he would want us to do that. So we all kind of stood off to the side. And here come like eight of the bad guys and they're all running in. Dude turns around and, like, a Jedi ends up killing all of these eight dudes in the most spectacular fashion. He latches onto one, pancakes him, throws him in the air, nails him through the head, grabs another guy, throws him against the spikes against the wall, and then puts an explosive collar around his head, and he explodes into a million pieces. He pancakes the other four, they go flying into the air, and he shoots them all with different weapons as they're in the air. Within, like... Five seconds, all these bodies just hit the floor. (laughs) There's like stunned silence. And the guy just goes, and that's how Papa does it. (laughs) And for the next hour, he taught us how to do spectacular kills. He's like, here's how you latch, here's how you throw, here's how you pop them while they're in midair with the explosive collar. Here's this environmental thing that if you bring it down on top of everybody, we all get a multiplier for our points. And we had a blast. It's some of the most fun gaming I think I can remember in the past two, three years because this guy took the time yeah. to, to make us all better. He knew... He knew we weren't unskilled. He just knew we were ignorant of the dynamics of the game. And he took a moment to tell us how we could be more educated about how the game works, and therefore we could all have a good time. And he was being excellent to us because he could have just left. Right. Or he could have said, you're just a bunch of noobs and you suck, but he actually took the time. And we ended up, and I'm sure he had a better time because of it. Of course. And then on top of that, which is something you'll never know, but... You took away from that the want to do that for someone else. Yes. And yes, so exactly did the right. other two people alongside the, you and he. So yeah, that's three I mean, people now, and on top of him, who already did it. But that's three people who will go out, possibly do that to another three people. And, as they say, and another three people. And another yeah, three now people. I know if I'm in a game and it's got a unique dynamic and I happen to know it and a bunch of people join and they're new and they're just testing it out because, I mean... When we all think about how much time we have to play games, if, if something doesn't grab us or we don't understand it quickly, sometimes we drop it because we've got ten other things to try. Right. And what this guy did was provide for a really unique way for us to experience it without feeling bad about how we were doing. Yeah. He just let us know it was, it was different. You know what the saddest simplicity is of that? I'm sorry? I said the saddest simplicity of all of that is you and I are old enough, all three of us are, Imagine going to the park and people are throwing around the football or whatever. Right. But you had to see them, you know, up close. There's no rage quitting in real right. life. Yeah. But somebody's older brother would have taught you how to throw a spiral because it made his enjoyment of the game that he was going to be playing expound and expand and multiply because he's teaching. This is something that we all took for granted. And never thought that it was going to change, but now it's something that you have to say in front of a crowd at PAX, and 
they're having this aha moment that's almost sad that they're having it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sad in a way, I suppose. It's good that they're having the aha moment because they're thinking about it now. You know, you're, yes. you're doing a good job here. Yeah. But I hate to think of society on a whole, thanks to Internet anonymity or whatever we'd like to blame it on, not just go to that naturally. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, that that is one of the stories that, I mean, I have a ton of stories about someone was a jerk and I banned them. Right. Of course. <laughs> you know, or or my team banned them or whatever, and some of them are funny and some of them are clever, et cetera, but the, the story that means the most to me is that one because it's, it's that example yeah. of how you're going to stop misogyny. It is the example of how you're going to stop homophobia and racial behavior because you're going to crowd those guys out. Yeah. And and you know, once those guys get sort of crowded out by people optimizing for good experiences online, it's going to take time. Oh, yeah. And that's not the only tool. There needs to be a lot more mm -hmm. uh that the industry does. Right. And a lot more that we do as players to shame people. But what I've learned is, you know, that that example of good behavior causes more people to follow you around because they want to have that experience with you yeah. than, than not. I have people on my friends list that I have had on my friends list since uh, early 2006 when Shadowrun came out. Mm -hmm. Oh, I remember and Shadowrun. The only reason they're still on my friends list is the wonderful experience we had on Shadowrun cemented their... Uh, their sort of their ability to be a, a good team player. Yeah. yeah. And from that moment, you know, they, they've been my friends. We played other games and, and we've had an amazing time, but it just took that one game having that great experience to make that happen. Yeah. Same thing happened with our mutual friend, Eric. Uh, it, one game. And so many people on my friends list, if you just act like a human, if you treat people with dignity and respect like you want to be treated. Right. It's sad that it's revolutionary. But you have a good time. <laughs> yeah. I, you are, it's, it's so little investment and such a huge return. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I hope that people can take that away from your talks and even, you know, seeing this, that that's all it takes. One, and it sounds so hokey going into the holidays, but one random act of kindness. <laughs> can change someone's entire, you know, it sounds like bullshit, but it's true. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be random. Right. I mean, it can be planned. The, yeah, that's the Every key. Every time. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, like I said, we don't want to keep you too long, but I do want to know, uh, you know, what do you, what do you have in the pipeline? What do you have going on? I know you've, you've taken to a, a, a love of writing recently. Yes, well, not not recently. I, I I've just well, been able okay. to do it. Published <laughs> writing recently. That yeah, I have my book. Uh, my book, A Microsoft Life. Uh, my book, uh, my fiction book, After, mm -hmm. which is a post-apocalyptic uh, set of stories, is uh, still in the editing process, about to be done. Uh, I do have a short story that's on Kindle right now called A Singularity Problem, mm -hmm. um, so which is uh, an interesting discussion about the rejection of technology. What I tried to tell with that story was I, I often see people who are brilliant, amazing people who just can't grok at, at whatever level some form of technology. Um, I know a number of people who I consider to be absolutely uh, brilliant. I mean, just, just so far above me, it's not even funny, who just don't understand Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or don't like cell phones or or or... Uh, you know, th that type of thing. And what I tried to tell in, in that short story, a singularity problem, was the idea of what if that technology was so pervasive that you couldn't really function in society unless you could adhere to it. So imagine for a moment if, for whatever reason, uh, you, you were expected to live and be prosperous and be successful in today's world without electricity. You, you could survive, the Amish certainly do, right. but, but be successful and prosperous and rich and impactful on society 
without electricity. And it's a story really about um, the idea of the singularity, which is that concept of one day we will all be able to upload our, our brains into computers, and that, that represents the singularity. Like that right. would be the moment in time when humans become immortal. Uh, and what if you, your mind, for whatever reason, or your body, for whatever reason, rejected that ability? Like you were allergic to it from yeah. a mental perspective. If you and were 1% so, that were, yeah. I'm sorry? If you were a 1% or 2% that, like you said, had an allergy as a Right. Were. Yeah, that you just, for some reason, it didn't take. Right. Your, your mind just rejected false reality or your mind rejected simulated reality. How would you, what, what, would, what would be your role in society if everybody else was doing it? Right. And and so that's that's the that's the 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 premise of the short story, which is available on Kindle. Um, and then I have some other stuff coming out soon. I have a short story called uh, Buddy's Eye, that is coming out uh, probably in the next two weeks. It's about ten thousand words, so it's kind of long, but it's about um, it's a science fiction story set in the asteroid belt. Okay. And I don't want to go further because it's kind of a fun story. Okay. <laughs> well, then pick it up and read it. You said in about a week? Yeah, a week or two. Cool. Okay. I'll a week or two. I'll definitely find it. And uh, you also maintain a very interesting blog. I should I should update it more than I do. Uh, at <laughs> steptoe.com. Uh, that's S-T-E-P-T-O dot com. Yeah, I do. And um, I have actually like four entries I've been writing that are like, I'll probably just dump them all at once at some point, but um, ex expect them all pretty soon. But yes, uh, I have a lot of fun when I get a chance to write on the blog. The problem with the blog is that when I sit down to write a blog entry, I sit and think, uh, oh, I should finish this story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all <laughs> the I'm same. Writing. Yeah, you're sitting there, and it's, it's you at a computer, uh, at a keyboard. You could be working, or you could be... Blogging. Well, the blog, I mean, the blog does give me an opportunity to test material because I also do performance work. Well, tell us a little um, bit about fact, that, because a lot of people don't know that. Sure. I mean, I'm, I'll be performing in Seattle at the Triple Door on December 1st at uh, Damn It Liz uh, is doing a holiday special. Oh, really? So I'll be performing at that at Seattle on the Triple Door. You can go to, I believe it's dammitliz.com. Let me double check that. <laughs> I want to be absolutely positively sure. Type, 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 type. <laughs> yes, dammitliz.com, the very first inch for her holiday special. Molly Lewis is going to be there. Uh, the double clicks are going to be there. Kyle Stevens is going to be there. I'm going to be there. And we're going to have a nice, warm, fuzzy, somewhat spiritual holiday mm -hmm. special. It won't be like the Star Wars holiday special. Well, it might be like the Star Wars holiday. Well, are, we don't know yet. Are you going to have B. Arthur? I don't know. There, there, maybe the resurrected ghost. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, so no, it's, it's, I like to do spoken word, stand-up, like geek comedy in a way. I wrote a blog post about uh, pooping at work. I saw. In which and I detailed uh, all of the scenarios under which nerds forced with the, the need to poop in a place that's not their home, uh, might experience social anxiety and other things. And it turns into a... It's funny because you write that stuff out and it becomes like something you can very easily perform. And so I performed that at uh, the Scott Kurtz and Chris Straub's live show uh, in Seattle. Right. And I have another one that I'm writing right now about airplanes, about flying as a nerd. Um, and so it's along a similar vein. So uh, some of that stuff is fun because you can put it up on the blog and test it. Right. Right. Yeah. It's it's and like testing your your uh, your stand up without having to go in a smoke filled room without having to perform. And, yeah. <laughs> and be heckled. That's what. Comments so yeah. Are. So that's that's another side gig that I do. That's not, I see that you've been uh, learning to play bass. So are you going I to am. incorporate that into the performance side of things, or is this <laughs> just um, for you? I would love to do that. I actually, I've been trying to learn bass lines of a couple of uh, my favorite songs that my friends play uh, on stage, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a ways away from that, I think. I, was, I actually had my keyboard out. It's over there in the corner earlier tonight, and I was, I was playing oh. Still Alive. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I've been doing, um, 
uh, one of my favorite Long Winter songs uh, is Ultimatum. And I've been playing around with the bass line for that. Um, and, uh, gosh, any number of other songs that, that my friends play. And so it's interesting because I grew up, I, I learned music through piano and violin. Uh, up until the point I was like, from, from like 6 to 14, uh, I was playing piano and violin. And around 14, that just didn't, that wasn't cool. Right. <laughs> so I dropped it. And so picking up bass is fascinating because I was telling my bass instructor my musical history. And he was like, he was like, oh, that's going to be good because you know, you've got a foundation of learning music that will come right back to you. And he goes, oh, but wait, you're used to treble clef. And I'm like, no, I'm actually, I can read bass clef because I played piano. And so I've been having a lot of fun noodling around with that. I have a really nice bass that I got. It's a Douglas bass from Rondo Music. Nice. Um, and it's it's a violin body, so it's it's basically a Hoff clone, but um, it's it's a really nice short scale bass, and I've been having a blast. Awesome. Um, so I know that before you've done uh, the Joko cruises, are you going to be looking at you know more more Wootstock or anything on the traveling side of things? Yeah, I hope so. Um, it just everything's up in the air at the moment. Um, right. But uh, but yeah, I mean that's that's the stuff that I've had the most fun doing recently. And I think that um, it's uh, it's it's just exciting work to be able to stand in front of a crowd and make them laugh. Yeah. Or <laughs> we don't know or, no, we don't. Please. Right? I mean, you guys know it's like I mean, especially when it's when it's in an intimate setting. Yeah. You know, it could be. Absolutely. A Comic Con or a PAX or something like that, you can see the crowd, you know the room. And it's a blast. And so, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Well, man, um, did you have anything else that you'd like to mention or put out there? I know that we mentioned your blog and your Twitter. Uh, that's usually the easiest ways to find you, I found. Yeah, that's true. Um, no, I mean, I wrote a book, uh, you know, called A Microsoft Life, which is my, my stories of working at Microsoft. And there's an audio version of that that's also available from my website at Steptoe.com, which has special guests Will Wheaton and Paul and Storm and Joel Watson of Hijinks and Sue and Mike Furman and uh, Major Nelson from uh, Xbox. And there's a ton of great special guests on it. Uh, and it's an audio book, so you can get it from Bandcamp. Um, but, uh, but no, that's, that's pretty much my short story of Singularity Problem is out, and then I hope to have some more soon. Well, we can't wait to see things coming down the pipe from you. I know you have some unannounced stuff down the road, and we'll have I to do. revisit things whenever that's ready to be talked about, but, uh, I, I like what I've read so far. And, awesome. uh, and, and you're good people, so. Why, thank been, you. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure, man. Both of you. Oh, oh, <laughs> you, oh. I, I was honored to be asked to be here this evening. Well, thank you. We're going to let you get off to uh, you know taking care of your wife and those beautiful puppies of yours. Thanks. Uh, give them all hugs. Buddy, all right, I will uh, do so. He's a character. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, uh, for those of us watching for not Steptoe, but rather this bald guy and this beautiful lady, uh, at Dorkington uh, is going to be the Twitter. Head over to Damsels of Dorkington on Facebook, uh, dorkpride.com. Uh, I'm at Yenzer, she's at Blythe Renee, and uh, get out there, take our advice, go be excellent to each other, and yeah. see what it will get you. It'll at least get you some friends, but it'll get you a lot of, uh, lot of respect and adoration. Trust That's me. true. Get out there and do it. it. It makes it better for everyone. So, from all of us in Dorkington, to all of you, be excellent to each other. Steptoe, thank you so much. You're very and welcome. You guys have a good night. All right, good night. <laughs>